As a student of Renaissance medicine, anatomy, and the gendered body, I was initially very happy to participate in a new project concerning assembling objects in space rather than words on a screen. So the collaboration with my fellow co-curator certainly helped me to better mold and refine what I wanted to convey as a specialist of pre-modern anatomy. In general, I'd say that this experience gave me the chance to speak to a broader audience, and in some way in a different language, visual rather than verbal. I had the chance to let images and objects speak for themselves. And uh, with this exhibit I really wanted, and uh, I think this, this was a shared goal, uh, uh, so I wanted to paint the picture of the history of anatomy and human dissection as broad cultural and social phenomena, deeply dependent upon specific historical contexts. So to put it differently and a little paradoxically, we wanted to show how the history of anatomy is not just purely medical history. First of all, let me say that for the medieval, renaissance and even the early modern period, the definitions of science and medicine were much different than those we are used to, and that even the borders between science and non-science were rather blurred. For example, it is uh, not easy to always disentangle theology, uh, what we would call a theory of art of rep or uh, of representation, philosophy and natural history from medical and anatomical texts of the 16th century. Um, having said that, the most common myths that we encounter for Renaissance anatomy, myths that in the exhibition we try to expose as such, are two. So uh, the first one is the idea that until the 16th century, or even later, the church and then the counter-reformation church prohibited the opening of the human bodies or, in a rather different version of the myth, that there has always been a taboo surrounding the opening of the human bodies, an activity which, indeed, in some historical cases was seen as impure and polluting. But, on the opposite, in this exhibition we uh, have underlined the multifaceted relationships between Christianity and dissection, both at the level of representations and the cultural imagery, and at the level of the history of practices of opening up the bodies, which thrived in, in the Middle Ages, connected with religious rituals such as funerals and the search for relics in the saints' bodies. The second myth is that there was an, an anatomical revolution which began in the 16th century with Vesalius. That all of a sudden anatomists started to open up the bodies and to look for themselves, rejecting the medical authorities of the past and in particular that of Galen, second century a Greek physician but working in Rome, who has been for centuries the basis of medical knowledge and learning in Western and Eastern lands. We try to show that things were more nuanced and that the anatomical revolution of the 16th century went on within a very articulated relationship between the present and the past. For example, the imperative to open up the bodies as a practical foundation of medical knowledge was always stated with reference to Galen himself, who had much insisted upon that connection in his uh, writings.
for me it was uh, incredibly interesting and satisfying to see uh, a reproduction of a tablet uh, of which were typically used by brotherhoods of comforters who had the task to comfort uh, those people who were condemned to capital punishment in the hours and days before their execution. So this object is placed in the section of our exhibition which illustrates the spiritual preparation of the bodies, which happens before the actual act of dissection. So it is, uh, as it is uh, well known, um, bodies from official and public uh, dissections in the 16th century and even before the 16th century came from uh, the scaffold, basically, and we see many examples of images, especially by Berengario, uh, of bodies with nooses uh, and other in instruments for execution. So, before these criminals were executed, brotherhoods of comforters had the task of comfort their soul and prepare them to a Christian death. These tablets were used as a tool to make their, their souls concentrate on examples of martyrdom and Christian piety before they had to suffer the capital punishment. So what these uh, what this comforters did was to uh, hold these tablets very closely to the face of the condemned uh, until they reached the, sca the scaffolds and they were, for example, hanged. And they also had the function of making them concentrate on these virtuous and Christian examples among the screams and cries of the audience of public executions. What we find striking in these images is that the imagery of martyrdom is something that we find in anatomical uh, textbooks. There is a close connection between the imagery of the martyrs and even of Christ and the dissected body, which is a criminal but whose body functions as a tool for the natural science and understanding of the human body. historical origins of human dissection are linked to autopsies for legal purposes and to Christian cultic rituals. It is true that in pre-modern world, the relationships between surgery and anatomy have always been very close. Since the Middle Ages, precisely from the 13th century, a series of learned surgeons writing in Latin and taking up the teaching uh, of Galen and, above all, the teachings of the writers of the Arabic tradition figures like Avicenna and Rosas, for example, they started to write chapters on anatomy in their books in surgery, which were often collections of all surgical conditions and treatments of their times. However, even though in the dominant Galenic tradition, and at least up until the medical reforms of the 18th century, surgery is one of the three parts of medicine, 
along with pharmacy and prescribing the right diet and lifestyle, in practice, surgery has always been considered less prestigious than medicine properly speaking, which was indeed called physic or science of nature. In other words, surgery as a manual operation was less culturally and socially prestigious than physic, namely a science based on the theoretical knowledge of nature. Moreover, surgery was considered a domain of the outer or external parts of the body, the surface of the body, as opposed to the internal parts, which were, on the other hand, the object of pharmacy and physic. As such, surgery traditionally had to do with wounds, as we also see in the popular pictures of the wound man, uh, a, kind of a, a kind of a map of all possible wounds of the body. Uh, they had uh, surgery had also to do with swellings of all kinds, the practice of bloodletting, which was kind of a very popular uh, treatment for many, many, many medical and surgical conditions, and various conditions uh, like toothache, bladder and kidney stones, eye conditions such as cataracts, etc. Berengario was an interesting man. Besides the fact that he was on trial for assault and street fighting, and that he was rumored to sell fake ointments against syphilis in Rome, he became a professor of surgery after practicing as a surgeon or a barber surgeon for a few years in his father's workshop. Indeed, it is very interesting the fact that at some point in his life, he felt the need to start studying at the university and to graduate in medicine since he had a rather flourishing career ahead as a barber surgeon, a licensed practitioner who learned the trade in his father's shop and came to be popular among rather powerful and wealthy patrons and patients. It is indeed significant that he also felt the need to invent a rather different childhood than his real infancy, when in the preface of the Isagoge, which is the title of his widely read brief introduction to human anatomy, he claimed that he had learned Latin and Greek from one of the most famous humanists of the time, along with the young Prince of Carpi, his hometown. He then went on to learn the learned languages and to move in between the lower class culture of surgery and the social world of barbers and the higher class culture of official medicine.
In this conjuncture, it is not a surprise that he chose to write and publish on anatomy, which, like we have seen before, was on the rise and a discipline destined to bridge the gap between surgery and the science of human nature. Berengario had a successful career both as a professor and as a practitioner. While it has been for a long time an historiographical commonplace to look at Vesalius as a brave and solitary genius who challenged past authority and the medical establishment, Berengario was indeed part of the centuries-long rise of observation and experimentation in the natural sciences. Let's make one example. For centuries, medical authors in the name of Galen who first described it, had confirmed the existence of an anatomical structure called Rete Mirabile, a sort of a network of small bases that had the task of refining the animal spirits going up to the brain, communicating the physical sensations which had to be elaborated by the intellectual faculties. Berengario dismissed it with a few simple words, and I quote here from the Isagoge. Yet, I have never seen this net, and I believe that nature does not accomplish by many means that which she can accomplish by few means. End of quote. Observation and an economy principle beat medical tradition.